Hello, my name is Alia and I'm on a quest to discover Cairo and share whatever I find here on this channel. My goal is to go beyond the Pharaoh era and explore areas of Cairo that both foreigners and Egyptians don't seem to know that much about. That doesn't mean I won't be hitting the regular sites, but they're not exactly my top priority at the moment. So without further ado, let's start with the first place I visited and that is the Muhammad Ali Palace or also known as the Muhammad Ali Museum or the Manuel Palace. Now before we dive into anything, I need to clarify that the Muhammad Ali in question is not a boxer and if you seem to know a little bit about Egyptian history, he's also not Muhammad Ali Besha, the founder of modern Egypt. And yes, I need to admit that I'm guilty with assuming that this palace was actually his before I went there. As it turns out, Muhammad Ali Besha was actually born in 1769, while Muhammad Ali Tawfiq, the owner of this palace, was born in 1875. Now there's like a whole century between them, you guys. So the more you know, right? The more you learn. The ticket to enter this museum is actually 20 Egyptian pounds for Egyptians. I'm not really sure how much it would cost for foreigners to enter, but I think it's around 50 to 60 pounds. It's definitely not more than 100 pounds. Now, if you want to take photos inside, you can actually take them for free with your phone. But if you want to take professional photos with your professional camera, then you kind of have to buy another ticket, a photography ticket. For Egyptians, that ticket is 20 pounds. For foreigners, it is 50 pounds. Now, if you're wondering about the price changes, it's because the government is always trying to promote inner tourism for Egyptians to actually enter these sites. Sometimes they would even like give more discounted prices for students if they show their student IDs. Before, they used to be for free for students, but now, you know, inflation and all this blah, blah, blah crap. But yeah, this is why uh, you'll find a lot of differences in prices in so many of the touristic areas because the government is trying to promote Egyptians to know more about the country because apparently not a lot of people are interested. I'm interested though and I'm taking advantage of this discount. The thing is, even after you buy these tickets, there are two things that you're not allowed. One, to use flash, and I totally get that because, you know, the old artifacts, we don't want to destroy it with a flash and everything. I get that. But the second thing is you still can't take videos inside. And the main reason I actually bought the photography ticket was actually to film inside because I was interested in making a video. And I only discovered that while I was filming the entrance of the place and I was told, no, you're not allowed to film because that's an extra 300 pounds. Yes, you have to cough up another 300 pounds to film inside. It's a hell of a lot of money just to film, you know? So I'm sorry, but you'll have to content yourself with still images throughout this video. Go man. But I mean, there are some parts I filmed before I was told I wasn't allowed to film. Now, this whole museum area is made up of nine parts, but I won't be showing you all nine because there were areas that were out of bounds or there were areas that were under construction. They're fixing things up in them, so we couldn't go to all these places. So construction on this palace started in 1901. It is in El Maniel Island area in Roda, Cairo, and it's made up of 61,711 meters squared. 5,000 of which happen to be the spaces for the actual buildings. It features so many diverse Islamic designs, which makes it one of the most unique and absolutely most gorgeous gems in Islamic history. Let's start with the first one, Saray el istiqbal It's actually the building you see as you enter the front gate. This is what it looks like from the inside, now, it's made up of two floors, the first one for men and the second for women. On the first floor, there's the ceremonies room, which is for the VIP visitors to come to visit. After you enter that you can go inside, there's another room that actually fascinated me and my friends so much because it is the reception room for VIP guest prayers. That's right, even prayers come in different levels of importance. Ignore the fact that Islam teaches us all about humility. People who come to pray in Muhammad Ali's mosque are categorized as normal or VIP people and VIP people have their own freaking hole. As for your second floor, it's for the women. On the way up there, you get to see a beautiful miniature of the Kaitabai Mosque. As with the downstairs, there are two rooms here as well. The Moroccan room with a Moroccan style design. And a chamois room or Levantine room in a chamois style. They look so great, don't they? The interesting thing about the Levantine room is that since women were 
known to gossip when they gather together, all the tables in this room have this saying carved into them. Salamat al-insan fi Which, according to Wiktionary, translates to The safety of mankind is in the protection of the tongue AKA, just stop gossiping and don't talk about other people and no one will be harmed Easy peasy, lemon squeezy Now on to part two, we get out of the reception palace We take a right and we will be smack dab in front of the clock tower Built in the style of Andalusian and Moroccan minarets, it's a clock that's part of a set. The second one, which is the most famous one, is actually found in the Egyptian railway station. However, the difference between both of them is that this particular one has snakes for hands. Awesome, right? It's also been used to send messages by fire at night and by smoke in the morning. After that, we will continue and find the mosque. You know, the same mosque the VIP prayers people were met in so they can come pray here, that mosque. Okay, this is considered to be an architectural masterpiece. The prince was careful to decorate both the outside and the inside elaborately. The ceilings are incredibly elaborate. Do you see that sun up there? It's actually one of the symbols associated with the Ottoman Empire. And the great thing about it is that on the outside, there's this big plaque that shows what each and every person that contributed to making this mosque did and their role in it. And it was pretty, pretty awesome. Like the mosque is absolutely beautiful on the inside anyway, but like to give credit where credit is due is actually awesome especially in such an old time where people loved to you know show off after that comes part four the hunting museum it's actually very morbid and features a ton of stuffed animals he'd caught on his hunting trips where he caught them and when By the way, there was a hell of a lot of butterflies in there. It kept making me wonder if he had a thing against them. Like, do you hate butterflies so much? Is that the reason why you keep killing them off? I mean, dude, there was like hundreds of them inside. It also has two skeletons inside. Um, one of a camel that used to transport the Kaaba Kiswa, which is the outer part that covers the Kaaba. Um, since Egypt was actually in charge of that at the time. The second was of his precious horse, which as the story goes, he apparently fell off the back of and sustained a bad injury that resulted in him being impotent. Wow. I mean, honestly, with how things went back then, it's a surprise he didn't even kill the horse straight away and kept him till his dying days. Part five, the very vast gardens full of trees and plants. It was one of the places we unfortunately weren't allowed to enter, but I'm told it's under repairs, which is a great thing because it didn't look so great from the outside. It was a big shame because of the fact that this place is known for its gardens. I mean, like Muhammad Ali took very, very good care of his gardens. He imported thousands of trees from all over. Part six, the residence palace. This one was rather large, actually. It was the first building to be built in this place. It's also two floors, but the top one was out of bounds because the stairs were unstable and, you know, liabilities, they wouldn't want to kill people. So once you get inside, you have the fountain hall. It has a beautiful marble fountain, which does work, but they don't turn it on, although they do maintain it. First, you have the silver room. Everything there is made of silver, including this elaborate centerpiece. And if you notice, the tiers are all pretty low because he was actually rather short and didn't want people to be at a higher eye level than him. Next to it is the shell room where everything was made from shells. Then comes the fireplace room, where they went if it got too cold. It actually does have a working fireplace that weirdly connects oil heating pipes with sandalwood that both withstood the heat and emitted a beautiful smell when it heated up. We're not allowed up the second floor like I mentioned, but here's a painting of him. Oh, and do you see this mirror? It's said it's at the perfect angle that while he's upstairs, he can see straight into the dining room to figure out when they're actually done setting the food so that he can come downstairs. Awesome, right? Very utilitarian. This room right here is called the Shekma. Apparently the Shekma is a balcony area that is 
outside of the actual building. Well, this isn't a balcony per se, but it does have the shape that, you know, the, this part of the room comes outside of the building. It also has a distinguishable fireplace in a pyramid shape of sorts. Now onto the blue room, which is also his office room. It's said to be one of the only two to have a working AC that was given to him upon their invention of the time. I honestly thought this place was gonna be super old, but apparently they had heaters and they had ACs at a time. So apparently people were very advanced 100 years ago. Next comes the mirror hall. In it, there's a lot of paintings of old rulers, beautiful ornate furniture, old currencies, and an upper viewing area for women. There's also a harem room where women can sit and listen to what's going on in the hall without being seen. Now onto number seven, the throne room. Apparently the reason behind the throne room is to remind people that after his father and brother, he was the rightful heir next in line to rule Egypt. It's made of two floors. The lower floor has this massive throne-like area covered in paintings and mirrors. The upper part has the obeisian room and two winter holes suitable for a winter setting. Oh, and the interesting thing about this throne room, apparently the ceiling fell down at some point and they built it back up. So that's a relief to know. Number eight, the special museum, which apparently has 15 holes. We only went into one of them, which had a display of his entire life in images and descriptions. It was very interesting to learn more about his life. And there was this really nice guide that told us a lot more. The next is the golden hall, which I think was also under construction. I mean, they didn't tell us anything about it or where to find it. Although there was an area they told us was under construction. So I don't know, or is it like a secret and only special people know about it? I feel so disappointed. Okay, now onto the most fascinating thing about this whole museum or palace or whatever it is you want to call it, is that every single ceiling in each and every room of the place was different, was entirely different in design, in era, in whatever it is he chose to put up there. Even when they looked kind of similar, there were these like small discrete, you know, differences between them. If you look carefully, you will find out that it isn't similar at all. Everything was different. And I found that to be so incredible and surreal and really beautiful. I mean, like the first thing I started doing every time I entered a room was like, look up, look at the ceiling, see how it looks and be fascinated because every design was different. So if I managed to make you excited to actually visit this area, the visiting hours are actually from nine to four, except on Thursdays, it's from nine to nine. I think it's another way to get people more interested in visiting it. They do have guides throughout the area, some better than others, let's say. The problem is I haven't seen one that actually spoke English. While we were there, there was a foreigner there and he had to wander around alone while other groups of Egyptians going in. There was a guide that would help them with explaining everything. So I'm sorry about that, but there are some signs in some places that will tell you some of the stories. Unfortunately, they're not enough because I feel the guides actually have such amazing information that I would not have known otherwise unless they had told me it. So that part kind of sucks. Hopefully they'll find guides that actually can translate in English for foreigners in the future, or maybe they do and we just weren't lucky to come on a day that they were there, who knows. Anyhow, I look forward to exploring more places and showcasing them to you guys here. So, you know, if you wanna know more about those places that I do visit, you know, subscribe, hit that button, hit the bell button, they're very enticing. Anyhow, that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Bye.